right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lee Reiners, and I'm the Executive Director of the Global Financial Market Center here at Duke Law. And we are very fortunate today to be joined by Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Commissioner Rostin Benham, uh, as well as former Deputy Treasury Secretary uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin for a conversation around the risk that climate change poses to the stability of our financial system. Since joining the CFTC in 2017, Commissioner Benham has advocated that the CFTC utilize its authority and expertise to ensure the derivatives markets innovate responsibly within an appropriate oversight framework. He recently led the CFTC's effort to establish the Climate-Related Market Risk Subcommittee. The subcommittee will identify and examine climate change-related financial and market risks, which some argue are comparable to those posed by the 2008 mortgage meltdown. Governor Raskin served as Deputy Treasury, Sec Deputy Treasury Secretary from 2014 to January 2017. Previously, she served as a governor of the Federal Reserve Board and is currently a Rubenstein Fellow here at Duke. We'll reserve the last 15 minutes for uh, Q&A, so I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, there will be a microphone passed around because this event is being live streamed. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Commissioner Benham and Governor Raskin to Duke. Well, thank you, Lee. Thank you all for um, coming. I certainly want to start with really a huge um, bravo to Lee Reiners and, the, and Duke's Global Financial Market Center for holding this conversation today. Um, a note on the Global Financial Market Center um, here at Duke. For me, I have to say, it is really one of the go-to financial market information hubs um, for questions that no one else is asking, and for answers that you might not have imagined yourself. Um, so it should come as no surprise to any of us that the Global Financial Market Center is now asking a question that very few uh, financial market analysts and academics are thoroughly uh, and comprehensively grappling with. Um, and that is the impact of climate change on financial stability. So to underscore this, you might be scratching your heads a little bit and saying, wait a minute, um, there's been plenty of stuff said about climate change. Uh, there is tons that has been written about on climate change um, in the investment space. Um, after all, um, a lot of us have focused on um, the E, in ESG investing, right? The E standing for uh, in, in the environment. So, hey, so how can this be really something all that um, important or all that novel? Um, and I wanna just, just wanna point out at the outset that there's a directionality point here. Um, the point of how markets affect climate change is the question that I think has been very well worked on. It's a markets first kind of orientation. What we're talking about today is we're gonna flip the directionality and we're looking at the impact of climate change on markets, on financial stability, not the other way around. So this, I dare say, is what is gonna make today's conversation um, really uh, novel um, cutting edge and rich with analogy. Um, and so this is why we're having this conversation uh, with the right person to be having it uh, with at the federal, uh, from the federal financial regulatory apparatus, and that is um, Commissioner Benham, who uh, you will see uh, is an emerging leader in, um, in the United States among the financial regulators. What he is doing is on the cutting edge uh, regard in, in the US among federal financial regulators, okay? We can talk about what's going on in the rest of the world, but in the US, this is where we're, this is, this is where we're leading from here. So um, again, to Lee and the Global Financial Market Center, Commissioner Benham, thank you all for, um, for assembling us on this topic with its particular directionality. Um, I also want to thank Professor Lawrence Baxter, um, of course, who um, is really um, helped me 
in articulating the importance of this directionality. Uh, this, again, uh, is, I think, an important, uh, an important conceptual articulation. Um, so, collectively, um, there have been many people, like Professor Baxter, um, who have been thinkers on risk. They have been thinkers in the risk space. And this, uh, you know, this focus on risk um, undoubtedly makes a lot of us um, very annoying parents. Um, but in the realm of financial stability, uh, particularly after the global financial crisis, we think a lot about how to identify risk um, and how to mitigate that risk, how the risk moves through um, a system, and then once we identify that transmission, how, how to mitigate it. So we, we think about this. There are people thinking about this quite a bit. And, um, you know, so much so that after the global financial crisis, you know, the most common question I would get would be, you know, what is the risk that keeps you up at night? What is the biggest risk that you worry about? And I have to say, for the longest time, it really was cybersecurity. It was cyber risk. And I decided, uh, because I was in a position to, I could do something about it. I could actually, um, from, the, from the perch at Treasury, be able to start figuring out a way to address cybersecurity. And by the way, I should say, when we started, we knew very little about it. We weren't able to um, really, uh, it, you know, took, took some work to kind of get that um, off the ground. And again, looking at it from the perspective of uh, financial stability. But I have to say now, when I get asked that question, I have a different answer. I mean, cybersecurity is still a risk, but I feel like it is being addressed. And the fear that I have now centers around climate change and, a, and its impact on financial stability. Not because, um, you know, not because I'm absolutely convinced that this is going to tip us into some kind of financial catastrophe, but because of what I don't know, because of the fact that it's actually not in the U.S. being addressed right now. So it's that vacuum that actually concerns me um, more than anything. Um, so, you know, we, you know, just a note actually on cybersecurity and on cyber risk, you know, we, we had a hard time trying to understand it for a while, but we did eventually uh, do that. We, we mobilized the financial sector to do something about it, and, and, and this has happened. Um, this hasn't happened in the U.S. Um, from a climate change perspective. Uh, we see in other countries, other central banks, other financial regulators doing things. We've got the Bank of England, very early outspoken advocate in Mark Carney on climate change and its impact. The European Central Bank has identified, um, has <coughs> identified the purchase of green, the potential purchase of green bonds as a tool in quantitative easing under the appropriate regulatory framework, that's like huge. I mean, we are nowhere near those kinds of discussions um, in the U.S. So climate change really is the risk that I'm, 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 I'm fearing has not been rigorously and systematically addressed by U.S. financial regulators. So with that, Look who we have. I turn to a U.S. financial regulator who is doing something, and that is um, Commissioner Benham. So what I want to talk about, or what I, what I want us to hear, is kind of what he's doing, um, what we can learn from your example, and where this is likely to lead. So with that, let me unpackage the issue. Thank you for being here, and just start by sort of level setting for us, what is the role of the CFTC in this space? Uh, thank you, Governor Raskin. It's great to be here. Thank you to all of the students in Duke, Professor Baxter, Lee in the center. Um, it's great to be down here and talking with you about these issues. I think, and I'm sure a lot of you know 
about the sort of patchwork of financial regulators that we have in the U.S., but indulge me for a second, and I think this will help unpack the issue and tell the story um, while we have time. The CFTC is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, it's one of two market regulators in D.C., uh, the other sort of being our sister agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, the CFTC's mission is to promote integrity, resilience, and vibrancy in the derivatives market in the U.S. Um, and we do that, I think, very well. We have a, a very dedicated staff that has very bespoke particular knowledge about what really is a very specialized um, marketplace. And unlike the SEC, which their general mission is capital formation and the movement of capital. Um, the CFTC is about risk management and price discovery. Um, our markets are benchmarks for commodity prices across the globe, and market participants from all, specters, all uh, spectrums of the industry um, use our markets for risk management and price discovery. So just as an example, our market participants can include anybody from large financial institutions who have to hedge interest rate risk or currency risk to farmers and ranchers who are hedging commodity risk um, as they trade goods across borders. Or it could include asset managers or large manufacturers who are trading goods um, across borders as well. So a big pool of market participants and a really critical agency um, that provides a marketplace for individuals and institutions to manage risk, which what does that mean for investors and retail individuals and consumers, it means stable commodity prices, both at the grocery store, it means low stable prices at the gas station for fuel, um, and in any number of other commodities that we sort of consume uh, on a daily basis. So the CFTC is about 45 years old. Historically, our focus was agricultural commodities, um, but since the 70s, that sort of pool of commodities that we oversee has expanded to financial futures. And then as we rolled into the financial crisis, which the governor mentioned, um, our jurisdiction and mandate um, expanded greatly with the oversight of swaps. Um, and swaps before 2010, which was when the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act was passed, were previously unregulated. So currently, we oversee futures contracts swaps contracts, and options on futures. So a big mandate, a very large market, um, but something we you know, take uh, with particular sensitivity to, we do on a, on a daily basis, um, very thoughtful work and oversee our participants and our, our registrants. Um, the commission is composed of five commissioners, which is very typical. There's over a dozen commissions in, in DC, which I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of them. Um, by law and by rule, we can't have more than three of the same political party. So while the White House is um, in Republican hands, we have three Republicans at the commission and two Democrats. I'm one of the two Democrats at the commission. Um, and each of us sort of weighs in and works around really the chairman who calls the agenda and really decides um, what policies the, the agency is going to take up on a daily basis. As a commissioner, and especially as a minority commissioner, and I say this pretty frequently, um, we have different tools to advocate. We have different tools to sort of um, articulate our vision and our policy priorities. But one of the most important tools, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is advisory committees. Advisory committees are very popular um, sort of mechanisms in Washington. Their general purpose is to, to serve and to provide advice and recommendations to an agency or a commission. So within the CFTC, we have five advisory committees, and each commissioner sponsors one of the advisory committees. And they're really great vehicles for each commissioner, um, specifically while we're sort of working at the whims of the chairman, um, to be able to advocate and articulate issues that he or she cares about deeply or thinks is something that, from a policy perspective, we should be addressing. So within my uh, purview, I oversee the Market Risk Advisory Committee, which you can imagine by its name is fairly broad, and the mission is fairly broad as well. Um, and in the past two years that I've been a commissioner, um, I focused on two prim primary issues. One um, is the transition away from LIBOR, which is a benchmark, uh, which is very common in all of our um, contracts that we deal with, whether it's a mortgage or a student loan, 
Um, but the other issue, as we've discussed and we'll discuss more extensively this, this afternoon, is uh, climate change and the effects climate change has on financial markets. Um, as okay, so let's talk about climate change. So yeah, what, yeah. like how, how is it that you um, really became interested yeah. in using this market risk advisory committee to be a vehicle for yeah. um, this risk that, you know, is a real real risk, yeah. but I would argue is not being addressed thoroughly. So before I started uh, working at the CFTC, I was, I was confirmed by the Senate in August of 2017 and started shortly thereafter as a commissioner. Um, I spent six and a half years working in the United States Senate. I worked on the Senate Agriculture Committee. Um, I worked for Debbie Stabenow, who's a Democrat from Michigan, and she was the, both the chair and the ranking um, member of the committee when I worked for her. So essentially the the leader of the committee um, when we were the majority and the minority as well. Getting exposed to agricultural issues and learning about sort of rural challenges that farmers and producers face started to think about climate change. And from the senator's perspective, this was an issue that she focused on since day one that I started working with her. So over the course of the six and a half years I worked with her, and that included um, the 2014 Farm Bill, Farm Bill being the sort of major farm policy that the Ag Committee and, and DC passes, climate change was an issue that she sort of forced all of her staff to think about on a daily basis. So thinking about within the context of legislation, and it wasn't necessarily something that is um, outwardly obvious when you look at some of the policies that she championed, but thinking about the Farm Bill, there's conservation practices, there's crop insurance programs, there's forestry um, provisions, there's energy uh, programs. All these different programs within the Farm Bill had woven into them some element of climate change. And what was she seeing, actually, or what were you all seeing yeah. back then that made you really kind of early sort of yeah. early adopters of the, of the of this as an issue. So within the six six and a half years that I worked there, there were instances where as a as from a, as a, a policy body, she needed to address droughts, wildfires, um, heat waves, and then pest and disease issues and flooding, of course. So within a short span of time that I was with her throughout the Midwest, the north and the south, you had all of these weather events compounding, certain issues that growers had to deal with. Um, and there was always an initiative and sort of a desire to come up with policy to help and support these rural communities. Rural communities are by far the most vulnerable and the least prepared for these weather events. We see it all the time with the hurricane season. We've seen it with the flooding in the Midwest this past spring, and we're seeing it um, with the wildfires out west even to this day. You have all of these weather events that are happening more frequently and with the greater extreme that the policy response needed to be quick and it needed to be assertive and it needed to be surgical so that we could address them in a very targeted way. So from my perspective, as I sort of experienced this time on the committee, climate change became something I was always thinking about. Transitioning to the CFTC, I started reading literature on climate change. Um, the National Climate Assessment, I would recommend all of you to take a look at that. It's a, a document, it's a the product of a multi-agency effort that's required by law, 1990 law, um, that really approaches and tackles issues related to climate change. And just uh, hundreds of pages of documents, but so many really unbelievable um, facts about what has happening to our climate. One thing that stands out to me always is that the average annual temperature has increased 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since the last century it's expected to increase another two to three degrees by 2100. And with that, we're gonna see more extreme weather events um, on a regular basis across the country, causing these floods, greater rainfalls, forest fires, uh, and whatnot. And naturally, as I sort of read that, compounded with my experience in the Senate, and then thinking about my current role at the CFTC, these weather events are gonna to start to have real effects on the economy, and they are, we're seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. After these economic events happen, what does that mean for downstream um, consequences on financial markets? What does that mean for land valuations? What does that mean for collateralized land that a bank has loans on when the borrower can't pay back a mortgage, whether it's commercial or private? Um, what does that mean for any number of other, from a farmer's perspective, their land is only as valuable as what they can produce. 
Um, in the Midwest, I think up until August, we had the rainiest year on record um, in the history of the U.S. since we've been recording it. Uh, plantings for both corn and soybeans were well below average as of June of 2019. So these farmers weren't able to put seed in the ground until June. And then I think on the back end, we had some blizzard conditions in the Dakotas and Montana in October. So their, their growing season is truncated. They're not able to plant um, uh, any seeds, and then they're not able to harvest the commodity to sell, and that means they can't take loans out, they can't repay their debt. And then it becomes this vicious cycle where you have regional lenders potentially having risk of, uh, of loans, and then what does that mean for the larger financial system as these uh, pockets of regional risk start to accumulate and become more of a national issue? So it was this interesting sequence of events from my time in the Senate and learning about agriculture, learning about the challenges of rural communities, talking about the literature that I've read, whether it's the National Climate Assessment, and then pivoting to my current job, um, where the CFTC really is uniquely positioned as a risk management agency and a price discovery agency. Mm -hmm. And then all within the context of this advisory committee, which we can talk a little bit more about, um, and what I view as the really the best vehicle to start talking about these issues. Yeah, so actually I, I do want to talk about the use of this committee as um, a good vehicle, but can you say a little bit more connecting the climate change or, or you know, climate events with, you know, how those events in your mind uh, potentially are transmitted to a, to become financial stability yeah. kind of events. And you don't have to speak with any, you know, particular authority because I know you're, this is part of what is going to get studied, but um, what, what might some of those transmission um, paths look like? Yeah. So it's a, it's a tough question, but, you know, I think you pointed out this earlier, Governor, I think we're all learning as we go on and as the days go by. And certainly this exercise that I've convened and I'm starting, I'm starting to learn a little bit more and hopefully we'll get more information. But as I've thought about it, um, to go sort of pivot quickly back to your earlier question and then I'll answer this current question, a lot of work has been done, as you pointed out, overseas um, on, this, on this issue. Um, specifically, Governor Carney at the Bank of England, um, within the Banque de France, the Network for Greening the Financial System has been a sort of coalition of central bankers thinking about climate change and financial market risk. And what I've read and what I think is, you know, a sort of uh, an agreed upon breakdown of how these risks exist um, is physical risk, transition risk, and then liability risk. We'll unpack those three and then I think I want to address your question more directly on a, just on a practical basis. So physical risk um, has been identified, as you would imagine, as literally the physical damage to infrastructure and to econ economies as a result of climate change. So think about residential homes, commercial buildings, infrastructure, roads, buildings, tunnels, bridges, um, coastline. I think I read a Morgan Stanley uh, uh, report that there's about um, a trillion dollars worth of coastal land value in the United States. Um, pair that with another fact that I read from NOAA, which is a um, um, uh, weather agency within the U.S., within the Department of Commerce, is that by 2050, 2050 over $100 billion worth of coastal land will be below sea level. So what does that mean for all of that, those land values on, on the U.S. coast, the West Coast, the Gulf, and the East Coast, if by 2050, a potentially 10% of the land value is going to be below sea level. So this physical risk element is something that I think we tangibly see on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, again, with a lot of um, thoughts and prayers to folks out in California who are dealing with the wildfires right now, but literally thousands, hundreds of homes being burned, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people being dislocated away from their families, what does that mean for those communities and those areas in northern and central and southern California right now um, and their ability to re return back to these lands and whether or not they're going to have the same valuations that they did beforehand? The second issue is transition risk. And transition risk is a really interesting sort of uh, idea. And it's as we shift to a low carbon economy, what is going to happen to these assets? Um, these assets are sort of dubbed stranded assets. Um, and I was reading something on the, the flight 
down uh, this morning, uh, Murray Energy, which is a coal producer, um, just filed for bankruptcy today, I believe. Um, and Murray's been in the news for a number of years, uh, but coal is a perfect example of a transition asset where basically an asset suffers a price impairment because of policy or regulation. So as we transition to a low carbon economy, what does that mean for current assets and the, um, the, the production assets that drive our economy today? Think about the number of jobs that are behind carbon emitting uh, energy producing and think about um, what, what percentage um, current um, energy sources drive our, our GDP. We have to be thoughtful both from a climate change perspective to shift away from carbon, but we also have to be sort of measured in how quickly we do it and at what pace we do it so that we're not shifting too quickly and um, dam damaging the economy more so than we need to. The last thing is liability risks. And liability risk, think about insurance. I'm going back to that statistic about a trillion dollars worth of land value on the coast. Um, think about the insurance claims and the potential legal liabilities regarding claims after these climate-related events. Another thing I thought about within the context of liability risks was corporate management and corporate governance. Um, thinking about corporate, just pure corporate law, what duties, fiduciary or otherwise, does the board of directors or sort of executives of a public company or private company have to start thinking about um, climate-related financial risks? Because Eventually and inevitably, if we continue to have these weather events, it's going to affect um, uh, the bottom line for these companies. Going back quickly to your original question with all of that in context, I've always thought about this just very simply. And I know my thoughts will evolve, I think, as this exercise continues and grows and we get recommendations, hopefully, from this committee. But it's in line with what I was discussing earlier with agriculture or with coastal lands. Um, most of the property and the assets are collateralized um, in one way or another, whether it's commercially or privately. And as these weather events start to damage these assets, you're gonna have stranded assets will, which will lose value very quickly and almost unknowingly. You will have land uh, that does not have, uh, cannot produce what it has produced in the past and you're gonna start having a migration of individuals and communities away from where they have historically been. And to my point earlier about rural communities being the most vulnerable, um, as they deal with trade implications and work being outsourced, this is just another layer of challenges that rural communities are gonna have to deal with. How are we as an economy and as a community and as a country gonna start to deal with um, all of these challenges which behind this collateralized land are regional banks or national banks. And at some point, if these institutions don't start considering, and I'm not suggesting they're not. I mean, one of the things that I've been very encouraged about is that privately these institutions are thinking about climate risk. What role does the government have in this sort of policy initiative is the, the bigger question and something that we're very far behind on. But as these assets become stranded, what does that mean for the risk to the larger financial system? One lesson I think we learned very clearly from the OA crisis was that the financial system is heavily interconnected. Um, you cannot pull on one stream without affecting another. And CFTC is a very unique regulator in the fact that it oversees derivatives markets, but our registrants, our participants in securities markets, our registrants, our participants in fixed income markets, the, the market, the financial markets are very interconnected. The players are all the same. Um, it's more concentrated, arguably, than it was before 2008. And as I see these institutions having these new climate risks, I think we have to be very sensitive to what risks each have and then how it sort of um, weaves into the larger financial system and whether or not there's financial stability issues to, to consider. I'll end, and you mm -hmm. said this, you know, this question of 2008, and, and Lee mentioned this, and what could climate do sort of in comparison to 2008 during the crisis? Governor Carney said something in his, in I think the Bank of England, most the most recent Bank of England report, it was 2018, fall of 2018. And he said something along the lines of, if we're at a point where climate change is gonna cause a 2008 type crisis, and I'm paraphrasing, we've gone far beyond um, that sort of atmospheric and environmental risk that we're facing, right? So if we ever get to a point where the financial system is on the brink, um, 
we have bigger problems that we're dealing with, right? Um, so we have to be very measured in how we approach this. I think our efforts are important in the larger conversation about climate change, but certainly financial markets and financial market participants participants play a really significant role in the stability of the markets, the ability of individuals and companies to get credit, the ability of the economy to keep growing and moving forward without these one-off events, which if they happen more frequently, <clears throat> the regional element is going to go away. So we're going to have compounding weather events happening at the same time, or they're going to be larger. Um, I can't emphasize enough, and again, you know, the, the devastation that's happening in California, but really just a, um, an unbelievable circumstance where you have folks, hundreds of thousands of people moving away because of dry conditions over the summer and unusually windy conditions right now um, that are really going to make people rethink how and where they live. And then <clears throat> from an insurance side, what becomes an insurable asset? And why should an insurance company be willing to insure that asset? And what does that mean for the price of that asset? And what does that mean for the risk of the asset owner itself? And that plays very well into the coastal flooding zones, too, with, you know, by 2050, if $100 billion worth of coastal property is going to be below sea level, who's going to be willing to insure that asset and who wants to live there? And what does that mean for current liabilities that exist on the books in connection with those, those lands and those assets? Mm -hmm. So uh, fascinating, and I've got to say, um, the role of government in particular, I think, is um, uh, something worth yeah. talking about a bit because you did say that you know that you see that the private sector has started to take this risk seriously, but the government may, you know, at least in the U.S., is lagging. And I, I want to just ask you something about that because um, maybe that's, you know, from one perspective, maybe that's okay, okay? Let's, you know, maybe it's okay. Let the private sector kind of take care of things. Some people might say that, you know, the private sector is um, potentially capable of handling this and we can, as a gov you know, as a federal government, take a back seat um, is one view. And yet what I'm starting to hear is, is something of, considerable concern, which is that the private sector, the private financial sector knows that their assets, many of their assets are going to be stranded, knows that a lot of their collateral is undervalued. And what they've been doing is they have been using the current regulatory structure to pass that risk onto the government. So the, a lot of those assets are, for example, in the housing context, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they are you know, they are buying from lenders that are rebuilding properties in hurricane zones. That risk now is going to be sitting with um, a potential line of credit from the federal government, which um, makes really this issue a much bigger problem. It, it is a public problem. It is a, it has a taxpayer, it could have taxpayer consequences if these risks are being shifted back to the taxpayer, um, you know, without, without any kind of questioning yeah. by the federal government. So that's, um, that I think suggests a role of the federal government that's really more than just kind of providing incentives for good kinds of, you know, green Behavior. investments, but in good kinds of behaviors, but something um, actually suggesting a potential review of our regulatory structure to see whether the regulatory structure that we have in place today is suitable for a world where these assets are um, potentially um, overvalued. I, it, two very different questions, but significant questions. And I think the role of government at this point needs to be mitigation, right? And working that sort of public part, pr public private partnership to come up with policies that, you know, one example of a really good private sector effort is the TCFD, which is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. It's being overseen by the Financial Stability Board and uh, Mayor Bloomberg is the chair of the effort. Very focused on disclosures, and disclosures you can imagine from an investor standpoint becomes a really critical uh, tool in making, you know, sound uh, investment decisions. 
as with any public company, right? It's all about disclosures and what you know be before you can make a good decision. Um, but I am very sensitive to your point, right? There's plenty of people who would suggest this should just be done by the private sector. Um, I'm not but advocating. I, think, I know I'm you're. Just, I know. I'm, I'm I know you're not. I know you're not. But like, I think um, people have probably been making that argument about climate change for the past thirty years and see where that's gotten us, right? So I don't think it's exactly uh, the, the right argument um, for those of who uh, for those are, that are making it. And I think there absolutely has to be a strong public sector role in this sort of conversation about how we can set policy um, that both incentivize but mitigates climate and protects the financial system as a whole. To your point about Fannie and Freddie, you know, I mentioned earlier crop insurance. Crop insurance um, is supported by the federal government um, for, for landowners, for growers. Um, obviously, mortgages and, and the roles that Fannie and Freddie play in that. Um, the hurricane disasters that we've seen for decades, but you know, more, more recently, whether it's Hurricane Harvey in, in the Houston area a few years ago, Hurricane Maria, um, Hurricane Michael, all of these events um, in the end uh, have sort of disaster recovery from FEMA or some other government agency. So I don't think that's necessarily going to stop, but from a budgetary standpoint, it becomes a real concern in what risks the government's willing to take. But I think, in my view, the priority now is to incentivize good behavior, to incentivize sort of green activity, and to help support folks to make sound business decisions and judgments, but also build communities that can be more resilient to some of these weather events so that we don't come in a situation where we're dislocating people yeah. or starting policy that um, either disincentivizes or doesn't allow um, families to, to purchase homes and, and get, have access to mortgages. It's, it's a very tricky issue, yeah. right? But um, the government certainly needs to start thinking about what role it plays and what sort of factors it considers in, in this sort of larger context of climate change and what debt and what risk it's willing, willing to put on its book as we approach a trillion dollar right. budget deficit, right? Right, um, right, right, right. So, so, um, so here we have this committee, yeah. you know, this um, market risk advisory committee, and it is um, coming out of, I would say, a little bit of an unlikely place, yep. but it's, you know, this is what we used to say in, you know, when we tried to tackle cyber risk, you know, like, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. So this is, this is the first bite, but you've pointed out to us that, of course, this, that the financial sector is very interconnected. Mm -hmm. What do you think this committee can accomplish? Like, what, how, I mean, should we, should we be completely, you know, is sort of very excited and, and, and await with bated breath the recommendations that come, or do you think it's going to be sort of a limited set of recommendations that will, you know, be quite confined to what the CFTC's right. mission is? Yeah. Well, I'm very excited, and I hope all <laughs> of you are very excited. Um, the, and I pointed this out at the very beginning of the talk, the MRAC, the Market Risk Advisory Committee sort of has dual mandate, dual mission. Um, one is to sort of oversee risk and see risk transfer, which you, you pointed out. We, as regulators now, post Dodd-Frank and post crisis, just observing risk as it crosses, uh, crosses the sort of financial system. And within our registrant pool, um, exchanges, clearing houses, swap dealers, future futures commission merchants, um, any other intermediaries, and then end users. I pointed out we have a strong sort of end user manufacturer community. The other mandate is to examine systemic risk as it relates to financial stability in both the derivatives markets and other financial markets. So pretty broad mandate and one that I think the climate discussion fits perfectly into. Um, given the fact that we have a very large pool of registrants and market participants, I think the CFTC is very uniquely positioned um, as, a, as a sort of um, additive to the other efforts that have been going on because we're going to have a broader sort of perception of what climate risks exist and how the market and the economy can react to them and potentially mitigate them. Um, the exercise started last June. As I mentioned, I've been thinking about this for well over a year because of the work that's been done at the Bank of England and TCFD and NGFS and the literature about climate and the science. 
But in June of 2019, I held a public meeting at the CFTC in Washington. Um, we had two panel discussion, uh, two, two groups of pa uh, discussion um, uh, panelists, and we had Bank of England was there, um, TCFD was there, we had a couple exchanges um, and academics. Very good conversation, and it was really laying the groundwork for what in my mind was the eventual next step of forming the subcommittee, but as a matter of process needed to do this to really give the public a sense of what I was thinking and that the fact that there is proven sort of conclusions and ideas and thought have that has gone into this issue. Um, and in my mind, there was a pretty overwhelming conclusion that financial markets are in fact um, going to be affected by climate change and there are risks that exist. So that happened in June, great discussion, pivoting to July, put out a public notice for um, applicants to join a subcommittee. Um, which is another sort of natural process within the, the committee structure um, to really convene a, a group of experts in the space um, and have them deliberate and start thinking about what market risks there are. And ultimately, and I pointed this out at the very beginning, the point of these, these advisory committees is to provide recommend policy recommendations to the commission. I certainly was a little bit uncertain of the reaction we would get, um, that I would get from the, the, the notice for applicants, but at 90 applicants, which is a big number, um, typically you're 30 or 40 at most on very common issues, 90 applicants from the largest sort of bank dealers, asset managers, insurance companies, grain traders within the agricultural space, large oil and gas, big pool of academics, um, data providers and service providers, exchanges. And these and are risk offices. type, like chief risk, risk officers. Chief not, these aren't like the government relations people. No government, there's literally one thing I decided is no government relations people. So we have commercial individuals, risk um, individuals, the sort of sustainability folks, um, but absolutely the individuals at the firms who are talking and thinking about risk and the commercial activity of the, of the, of the firm. So, in my mind, the best people, the people who have been thinking about it, um, and the hardest decision I had to make was I had to cut down um, 90 to about 30 to 35, which is never an easy decision given the pool of candidates, but um, you know, you can't have these committees to be too big because you want to find consensus and you want to sort of get to the goal line. Is there a role, by the way, for um, a participant to come from just the household sector from uh or, or yeah, yeah, so I mean, I would say the, the household sector becomes the public interest representation, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, we do have public interest through NGOs and through some think tanks, and in DC, we just have public interest associations that are, are um, uh, in town that represent the general sort of like retail perspective. So um, I think we have three or four um, public interest representation, um, but surprisingly, um, they're very forward thinking on these issues and they've been thinking about it both within the context of just climate change and financial market risk as well. So broad spectrum, I think unique from the other efforts that have been done globally and um, outside of DC, but really is gonna give the commission an opportunity to think about what risks these manufacturers and the commercial folks are thinking about. To answer the, the last part of your question about the scope, um, I still view this within the context of financial markets and what we learned in 2008. Um, I am gonna certainly be uh, mindful of my role at the CFTC vis-a-vis -vis other regulators in town, both at the prudential regulators and at the SEC. But as I've read about this issue, the high level approaches to addressing climate-related financial risk really come down to a bucket of, uh, of policy ideas, and that's Disclosures. What types of disclosures to f do financial market participants need to make, need to consider making in order to allow investors and the public and policymakers to have an understanding and a good hold on what they're doing, both from an investment side and also from a regulatory policy side. Um, within a sort of subgroup of disclosures is taxonomy. Taxonomy being data. How are we going to standardize um, definitions within this space? Um, sort of a, a funny joke I heard last week at the World Bank meetings, when I'm sure it's, I'm not sure it's funny, but it was, a, it was an attempted joke, was 50 shades of green, right? Like, what does green mean? It can mean something to everyone, and it can mean something different to everyone, unless, I think, as a policy um, coalition, we come up with a standard definition for terms and a standard of way of doing business within this space so that 
again, either as an investor or as a regulator, we have a benchmark of what we're valuing and what we're judging activities by. Um, best practices and governance. I talked about liability risk. What type of governance practices and uh, governance initiatives and efforts and best practices are companies taking internally at the board level to address some of these climate risks and making sure that they are, whether it's a subcommittee or a group of individuals at the highest level uh, of companies to start thinking about climate change. Um, something that you're very familiar with and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this is scenario analysis and stress testing. You know, what role should regulators play or the internal entities play in stress testing or doing analysis on any number of scenarios that might occur? Within the CFTC, our riskiest registrant are clearinghouses. Clearinghouses, particularly after the mandate for um, uh, the oversight of swaps, which I mentioned earlier, um, have become systemically important institutions as designated by, by, by EPSOC. We do scenario analysis on um, extreme but plausible. So in, in an extreme but plausible scenario analysis is if two clearing members of a clearing house fail. And I don't know what the statistics are, but it's a very, very unlikely um, circumstance that two clearing members, these are the large, large institutions that are essentially acting as brokers between an investor and a clearing house. Um, a very, very unlikely scenario. But point being is it's an, it's an analysis that we do because we want on that sort of bell curve of events, we want to make sure we have every possible event covered so that we're protected and doing whatever we can um, to mitigate risk. Um, so those are some ideas that have been coming up very frequently within the context of climate change and how sort of policymakers and companies can be thinking about um, all of these risks. And within the context of the subcommittee, you know, we don't necessarily have to be prescriptive. I've given a relatively short timeline to the, the committee. I'm hoping by June or July of 2020 we'll have recommendations, which will be one year since the initial meeting. But since there's a vacuum in DC, since the policy uh, conversation is really not happening, I think this effort within the CFTC can be a first of its kind, and it could really start to lay out from a US perspective some high-level, smart policy initiatives that can be used as sort of a benchmark of what we need to do domestically to start to address some of these issues. And I think the CFTC certainly can apply, and I would hope absolutely that a lot of the recommendations are derivatives focused. Um, but I would hope also that this document can be used as a tool for other regulators to learn from um, and to sort of extract ideas and policy uh, recommendations that they could apply individually to their own uh, registrant pool or their agency. And like I said, if, if, we, if we work at a high enough level where we can find consensus and, and build a coalition, but a deep enough level where there's meaningful uh, recommendations, I think a lot of people can take a lot of, uh, of smart um, useful things away from the document. Yeah, that is really good to hear, because I think the last thing we need is kind of just yet another report. I yeah. mean, I think we want um, to take the, you know, if we're going to take this risk seriously, um, which many do, I think we want to see what comes out of that yeah. report and have it really be the beginning yeah. of um, of something that I, you know, do think is absent in yeah. the in, in the U.S. in the financial regulatory yeah. space yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good time to open uh, the conversation. Um, and um, Lee, do you want to moderate that, or should I attempt? Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, Perfect. And introduce yourself too, so we can make sure we know you. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, my name's Henry. I'm a second year here. Um, thanks for being here. Um, so I, I understand this talk comes at the problem from your role with the market risk committee. So kind of presupposing that this risk, ex this risk exists and figuring out how to account for it. Um, but I'm curious to what extent the CFTC more broadly um, sees itself, I guess, as an agent in climate change. So as opposed to just mitigating risks um, to capital, actually mitigating the risk more broadly. So you mentioned at the beginning that you play a, you know, price stabilizing rule, a role rather. Um, and I'm just curious if CFTC talks about or discusses using that uh, that role to, you know, help maybe reduce our reliance on commodity-based practices that contribute to climate change. So 
potentially undervaluing gas or feed crops for, for meat products. Um, I'm just curious if you see yourself as not only mitigating risks to capital, to capital, but like mitigating the risk more broadly. Yeah, it's a great question. I would, so, you know, I often get the question about suggesting that we maybe set prices or we're monitoring prices as they move up and down, whether more quickly uh, than they should or higher or lower than what, maybe what the market really, uh, from, from a supply demand perspective. Um, and if you think about the arc of commodity prices in the past 20 years, we had a really drastic run up into 2008 in commodity prices and then um, leveled off. And if you think about oil and gas, I think, you know, barrel of oil was almost $140 in 2007 or eight, and then it's dropped off since, and then technology has driven prices to sort of moderate um, where they are now. My response to your question is our number one goal um, is to really fulfill our mission, right? And our mission is making sure that we're overseeing markets, protecting them, from bad actors, from manipulation, from fraud, making sure that they're transparent so that folks truly have an understanding of the, the supply demand dynamic within our markets. We are not a price setting agency. I think we do everything in our purview within the divisions we have, which include examinations, market surveillance, enforcement, to ensure that markets are truly working um, from, an, from an economic perspective on a fundamental basis and that the price discovery mechanism is working as it should be. Um, with that, I think that effort, and I think we're largely successful um, in that effort uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, the outcome, I think, would promote what you're sort of searching for is sort of stabilizing prices um, and incentivizing good behavior so that um, um, activity is, is happening um, without sort of infractions or, or disturbance from fraud or manipulation. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a tricky question that I, I feel a lot or some variation of it, but ultimately um, it comes down to us doing our job as a market overseer, surveiller, and regulator to ensure that you know, market participants are acting fairly and in a transparent way, and then the market dynamics are market prices are representative of, of just pure market dynamics. Is that helpful? And you, you can see the need to balance really the jurisdiction of the agency with what is, to some, in some, from some perspectives, a much bigger problem, right? And um, uh, that's that's certainly what I hear, yeah. you know, in your answer is that that imperative. We, you know, the CFTC is interesting because we're the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, right? The the, the products that we oversee are so wide ranging in scope from agricultural to energy to minerals uh, to crypto assets, right? And then financial futures, interest rates, currencies, benchmarks. Um, I would encourage all of you to look at the definition of commodity in, in law. It is so broad and that, you know, anything essentially that's not a security is a commodity or can be thrown into the bucket of commodity. So we have that history that relates to physical commodities um, we understand our role um, of stabilizing prices and making sure that markets function well and that end users have the ability to mitigate risk. Um, and I mentioned, you know, bread in the grocery store, gas at the pump, but, you know, think about uh, auto loans, you know, from a car manufacturer. You know, they need to be able to offset interest rate risk because they're issuing billions of dollars worth of, of, billions of, dollars worth of loans to, to auto purchasers. They're using our markets to offset that risk and, and take that variability out of um, their books and their earnings. So it's a, it's a fascinating market, but one that sort of touches everyone, um, but one that we have to play a very careful role in in, in balancing what our official sort of mandate is, um, but not overstepping our boundaries so that we're affecting the sort of medical supply demand. Uh, Jeff Kraus, I'm Assistant Dean for Alumni and Development here at the law school. Uh, two kind of related questions, or there is a relation between them. One is just my naivete around the CFTC and um, sort of to what extent in the future does the CFTC regulate commodities futures? For example, with your statistic about, you know, one-tenth of the coastline being gone by 2050, if people are allowed to trade very far in the future, you know, they could really <laughs> kind of know some stuff now. So that's just, I don't, I don't have a good enough understanding of the futures trading and how, what the parameters are. And then 
kind of related to your disclosure point, um, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember the, the Y2K scare and every co public company having a risk factor about that to the point where it was meaningless. And here it seems like different businesses with different, you know, like you said, commodities are wide ranging from energy to natural resources to food. A lot of them probably have related overall to climate change, but different elements of risk factors associated. And how do you see that disclosure playing out and how, you know, how specific will people get around that to, to be meaningful to an investor to decide? And that's where I think the markets can help if investors have information that says, hey, this is not a good long-term investment here. Um, so to address your first question, the duration of a contract, whether it's a future or a swap, is really up to the, the counterparties. Um, the exchanges for the exchange traded products, both those swaps and the futures, mostly the futures, it's a collaboration between the participants and the exchanges saying, look, this product would be liquid, we think it would function well and provide both the price discovery and the risk management tool. That all said, short answer is, I would say for the most part, your typical futures contract goes out a few years, you know, any within the month for sure, and then it'll go out a few years. But there certainly are um, swaps that can go out decades. Um, but again, it's all up to the sort of counterparties that want to participate. It's an interesting question because as I've read a bunch of literature about you know, different types of derivatives products that might start to emerge directly related to climate change. We've had exchange traded weather derivatives for years and these are very um, important tools for utilities to sort of manage demand of of energy as you know during a, a winter or summer season but I've just I've read some uh, ideas about air temperature derivatives and sea level derivatives and all of these you can imagine thinking about the sea level derivative you're an insurance company who again you know has property collateralized property on the coast you, you'd want to sort of be able to hedge some of that risk um, specifically within the context of sea level rise um, over a long duration of time so if that end user, the insurance company, was able to find a counterparty to take on, you know, a 30, 40, 50 year swap or future, you know, that would be a conversation between the counterparties and then maybe exchange. Um, again, our sort of uh, the dynamic we have to play in terms of transparent markets, but not doing any um, uh, anything that we're not prescribed, required to do. Um, Regarding your, your second question, disclosures, and this is an interesting dynamic that's occurring between the TCFD effort, which is the private sector effort. They're coming up with a lot of great um, standardized disclosures and data and information that they cohesively believe, and it's a seven or 800 group uh, um, organization, and a full spectrum, right, from financial services to commercial end users. Um, and they're trying to standardize this sort of disclosure um, uh, taxonomy, for lack of a better word. The interesting thing about disclosures is you're seeing this conversation really be a bottom-up um, deliverable from, it's within the context of ESG, right? It's what the investors want. And it's the investors in the context of 401k plans, retail investors going to their asset managers and saying, I need more information on what you know, company X, Y, and Z is investing in or how they're operating their business. This is where I see there has to be a thoughtful role for policymakers and regulators. The SEC has a voluntary disclosure system and I think it dates back to 2010 or 11, um, but again, it's voluntary and um, it has not been sort of updated or thought in a deliberative way to really analyze and think about what risks are out there and what information would be helpful to investors. I think a combination of the TCFD effort and then an I identification of what types of disclosures would work from a policy perspective could end up coming up with a, a broader um, level set um, uh, batch of disclosures and information that would be helpful. I would say, lastly, on the flip side, I've read and seen a lot of conversations about very exhaustive efforts to disclose everything, right? So if you're a company as an investor, he or she should know everything essentially about your carbon footprint. And this goes back to my point about transition risks. I think in theory that sounds great, right? But in practice, how would you implement that from a regulatory standpoint? 
from a company standpoint, how would you um, assess that and identify that sort of carbon footprint? And I'm not talking about internally within your organization. It's we want to know what your carbon footprint is. So everyone in your value chain, all of your vendors, all of your merchants, you name it, we need to know how you're connected in this web and what the carbon footprint is. And I think those are the tough questions that I think we have to ask and answer in this transition so that we get away from um, you know, carbon um, in, a, in a, an appropriate time, but also recognize that our economy is driven and has been driven um, by a few fundamental energy sources, employs a lot of people, and we have to be very thoughtful and deliberative about that transition so that we don't have unnecessary disruptions. My name is Rochelle Newton, and I am a technologist here at the law school. You hinted at this several times, but my question is, what is the role of technology in all of this? So, a good question, and one I think that's sort of emerging um, on in many fronts. Uh, but from a pure climate perspective, I think it's um, collecting data, having proper sort of transparency in uh, uh, data insemination, and, and seeing how we can um, data dissemination, and seeing how we can uh, make sure that investors and the public is getting the data they need. Um, when I think about technology, and this is something we might talk about a little bit later, is, is the advent of blockchain and the advent of financial technology specifically, and, and the context of how we can standardize data and get it out to people in a much wider, broader, more uh, a quicker, uh, in a quicker manner. Um, that would certainly require a, a, a big shift, I think, for a lot of people to, to have access to data, to have access to technology. But um, at this point, I think um, the technology question becomes one of utilizing the sort of tools we have right now, um, potentially embracing some of the new technologies that are coming out. But um, you know, identifying scenario analysis, stress testing, this all requires, I think, from an organizational standpoint, in, in, an immense amount of technological advancement from a sort of climate detection standpoint, not only six months out or 12 months out, but decades out. So as I read the literature about the climate um, uh, risks that are, are, are sort of upon us between now and 2100, how are we able to do proper scenario analysis and how accurate is that scenario analysis? And then how can that analysis be embedded into sort of an enterprise risk management program? These are all questions that I think the larger institutions are thinking about and they have the resources to think about, but certainly within the US, we have organizations you know, examining weather forecasts very far into the future, but we have to start working together to have better assessments of where the weather's going and then integrate it into sort of our financial uh, analysis and our stress analysis so that we can have a better idea of, of what's going to happen to financial stability um, in, in the future. Thanks.